Hi everyone and welcome to this morning's webinar. This is the second webinar of the Agile 42 Connect uh, week that we are having right now. And today we have Bastian Wilhelms with us from Zipgate. We are really, really happy that he's gonna give us a short presentation today. And he will be talking a lot about metrics and storytelling techniques. So for sure, it's gonna be very interesting. Uh, today with me, I have my colleague Amy here, and we are going to be the hosts behind the scenes today. So you can feel free to chat with us. Uh, please chat with all attendees and panelists so that everyone in the audience can, can be aware of what's going on. And all your questions that you want to ask Bastian, you can put in the Q&A session today, and we will have a look at them in the end of the webinar. Uh, there's going to be another webinar also in the afternoon and then uh, also one tomorrow and we're going to share some links with you for this so that you can sign up if you didn't do it already. Um, we also have an optional donation going on this week. Uh, we really, really want you to help us to help other people uh, affected by the pandemic going on. And for only eight euros, you can feed one person for a whole month. So I really, really hope that you will help us help. Um, Bastian, I'm going to give you now uh, the word. The stage is yours. Um, we are recording the session, so uh, we will share this around with you later on. And if there's something that me and Amy can help out with, just reach out to us in the chat. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So my name is uh, Bastian, and um, I'm, uh, I've been with Zipgate since the uh, beginning, in two th 2003 to 2004. Um, I'm a member of the founding team, and my role at Zipgate today is um, called OP, um, O and P. Um, it stands for Organizational Portfolio, so um, it, uh, I'm responsible to, together with two other guys for um, how we organize, how we, how we work, and um, for the portfolio side, like what company bets we want to make, where we want to invest, uh, which teams uh, should work on which problems and tackle which problems. Uh, Zipgate is a little bit special, I think, because we are, um, we're a very small company compared to our competitors. So uh, we are a telco and um, in our market, uh, most other telcos are huge. They have like thousands of uh, employees. We only have uh, just over 200, um, but, and this is kind of special, um, we do a lot of the technical stuff ourselves. We are vertically integrated, so uh, we, uh, manage our own core network. Uh, we are an MVNO, but also a voice by IP company. We have uh, about 2 million uh, customers in Germany, uh, most of which are residential customers, but the, our largest product is a um, Zipgate, it's called Zipgate Team, which is a kind of a business PBX, uh, which also integrates uh, mobile phone services from our own um, network. And um, we, we do a lot of coding at Zipgate, so we're a very technical company. We uh, kind of make a point of doing this stuff ourselves and not outsourcing it to China, like everyone else does, basically, to some uh, uh, network uh, partners. And um, the, point, the, point, the whole point of this is that we, like, as a very small player in a huge market with very large competitors, we uh, need to do things differently than our competitors. We, we have to uh, um, offer features that no one else can offer. So all the other uh, companies like Vodafone and Deutsche Telekom in Germany, they offer basically the same services. Um, if you get a mobile phone um, contract in Germany, it's pretty much, you know, it doesn't matter which company it comes from. Uh, if you choose Deutsche Telekom or Vodafone, you'll essentially get the same service. Um, that's different with Zipgate because we are able to offer features uh, in our network uh, that no one else can because they all buy by the cell uh, by the same builders of these network equipment um, companies and uh, and we code it ourselves. So that's basically um, the difference. But we are only 200 people so that's um, I think quite special. Um, this is what Zipgate looked like um, until 2009, until our big crisis. Um, 
to be honest, we kind of organized the company uh, not knowing there's a better way. We kind of organized it like we felt like we, we had learned in business school and stuff. So uh, this is what it looked like. Um, I think many of you will relate. <laughs> we um, had these departments um, at the bottom. Uh, we had like a management structure and then we had our CEOs. Um, that's basically um, the setup. And this, this posed some problems. Although we were quite successful at the time, uh, or we felt successful, um, we noticed there's, um, we noticed a couple of problems that were kind of off and that were irritating us. Uh, the most important being um, we hadn't shipped a product in 2009, uh, this was, um, we hadn't shipped a new product in three years. And um, at some point we stopped and uh, took a, a, a good look back and, um, and kind of noticed, okay, we have, uh, we had been rebuilding our whole backend system twice over the last three years, but there wasn't really anything that was reaching customers. So um, we kind of dug into that and with the help of Agile 42 found a better way, I'm gonna to get to that <laughs> and to organize, but this is um, what we look like. Like, I, I think the main problem of this setup was that um, like if someone, what, well, let me start another way. Um, to get something out the door, um, like a new feature, a new product, we had to involve all our departments, like the design department, the front end department, the back end department, the legal department, support, like every single department had to, uh, had to align and had to do stuff so we could ship something to our customers. It was like main problem because if someone had an idea in any of these uh, uh, departments, uh, they had to talk to their lead, to their to their boss, essentially, and uh, tell them, "Hey, I got this idea. Do you think this is cool?" And if this lead knew how his or her manager would decide, uh, they could make the decision right away. They could uh, say, "Okay, that's that's a great decision or a great idea. Let's do that." If they didn't know how the manager would decide, they had to talk to the manager and ask the manager about like which decision would you would you take here? Would you go this way or another way? So the manager kind of had the same situation. If the, the manager knew how the CEO would decide, um, they could just take the decision themselves. If not, they had to talk to the CEO and, you know, same, I think you would get the basic uh, problem. This um, was a lot of um, uh, talking, a lot of management structure that was needed in this type of organization. And it uh, essentially uh, made us, unable to move, unable to get anything out the door. Um, back, in the, uh, back in 2009, we tried a number of things to um, overcome this, but um, the only thing that really helped was, um, was when we, like one of our employees found a little booklet called uh, Scrum für Einsteiger, Scrum for Beginners, <laughs> like a little yellow book, um, and he told us about it and asked us to take a look at it because it could solve the, our current problems. Uh, we were vocal about this problem. We uh, told everyone about it, so um, that kind of helped. Uh, someone else came up with a, with a basic idea and then we reached out to HR42. Uh, actually, we searched for someone who had kind of done Scrum before um, to help us with, with the transition. Um, so in 2009, we started asking these questions like, is there a better way to organize? And um, I think we found one which, is, um, which makes us much more competitive in the marketplace, uh, which helps us reach a lot more uh, results, like actual customer results than most of our competitors. And this is um, this approach that we found is uh, based on decentral decentralization. So instead of kind of moving every single decision or most of the decisions through uh, like decision makers like CEO, like the CEO, uh, like I showed you before, uh, we kind of want that this is the basic, most basic concept. We want our teams to make like I always say 98% of all decisions themselves without talking or without the need to get approval from someone else. This 
totally fine to talk to someone else um, and you know get more input and stuff, but they should be able to make the decision themselves. And we're talking small teams here. Um, most of our teams are, I'd say, between five and ten people, so like the usual uh, size, especially in the Scrum setting. We do use other tools and frameworks uh, in our company. I'm going to get to that a little bit later. This is a setup, like a typical uh, setup for a Scrum team. Uh, outside of this little team circle, you, uh, we have the customers, and of course, the goal is that to move everyone in the um, in, in the team as closely to the customer as possible. So. Um, many teams do that by, for example, um, uh, some, some of our teams like have like a red telephone in the middle of the room and uh, this is the actual telephone that's ringing when a customer calls the hotline. So they actually, like if you have a problem with a, with a product you'll, and you call, you can actually talk to engineers, designers, uh, whoever is closest to the, to the telephone. That's just one um, small example. We also do a lot of um, uh, testing and um, yeah, a, a lot of stuff. We we make a huge point of you know pushing everyone as closely as possible uh, to the customers. This is also true for the whole org. So um, we have a number of teams. I think the actual number right now is uh, seventeen. So this is a highly simplified simplified version. Um, but um, same thing here. We want our teams to be as closely to the customers and to work as closely on customers' problems as possible. And um, we do that by um, giving them clear goals. So we tell them pretty much exactly what problem we want a team to work on. Um, and this surprises most of the people that, is, that see this. It's not open. It's not, you know, um, it's not their, um, yeah, their choice which problem to work on. And they're giving, they're, they're being given like really um, clear goals that they of mostly problems, customer problems that we want them to work on, and also constraints. Like, uh, for example, um, let's say there's a uh, there's a problem. We find out we need a new app for a certain market, a voice over IP app, let's say, and uh, and we could tell them it should cost at least twenty euros a month. It shouldn't be free, and it's not a, it's not allowed to have a free product, for example. No, that's just one, one of the governing constraints. Of course, we also use uh, enabling constraints, um, which are more, uh, you know, kind of hidden in the, in the goals. Um, the goal itself, the goals that we give our teams, they're um, kind of like a, like a one-pager, like a, a text uh, document where we uh, describe what problem we want the team to, to work on. And this is kind of my role. Um, I uh, at Zipgate, just so you know uh, where I work, what I do all day. Um, I work on setting these constraints and on uh, defining these goals. That's kind of the main job. And the other part is uh, to check if uh, if all our teams are still making progress. This can be qu uh, quite hard and tricky to see from inside a team. Um, because there's really, sometimes there's not much of a difference between having fun uh, working on a problem and actually being successful. That's, it can feel the same. So I think it's really important to have a, a function that's outside of the team, looking at how the team acts and interacts with the customers uh, to see if they're actually making progress. Um, the basic, uh, things we do is like if we notice a problem here and there we ask them you know do you need help uh, can we help you in any way that's like the uh, most basic stuff but it can you know escalate um, uh, to like stopping a team from working on a certain problem and maybe choosing another team or giving a team um, a different goal that's also possible all right um, so this is what our organization looks like today um, it's not very. Uh, it's not not a pyramid anymore. Uh, we have all these little circles that are talking to each other. Of course, we we now have products that are really su successful, where multiple teams work on the same products. Um, this is the black circle on the left. Uh, multiple Scrum teams working together with a sales team, a marketing team, and a support team. 
Um, these are all cross-functional. So even the sales team is cross-functional. Even our marketing team has engineers and designers in, in them. So it's not, it's not separated by function. It's uh, more the, um, yeah, what, we, what kind of problems we want the team to work on uh, that's determining um, what's written on these circles. Um, yeah, there are smaller products that only consist of one team working on these. Uh, which are more to the right here. And of course, we also have accounting and legal, which uh, help these teams uh, in their goals, support these teams. Um, I kind of touched this topic earlier. We don't use Scrum in all our teams. Um, we kind of found out that uh, it doesn't really make sense if you don't have a product yet to use Scrum because it's really costly. Uh, to prepare like a whole backlog and have like a number of like let's say 10 people working on something for two weeks that you had to prepare in advance which is really you know it's a heavy uh, burden <laughs> to come up with uh, all that stuff so in the experiment phase where we don't have product market fit yet we um, we more uh, we use uh, experiments uh, mvps we orientate um, on lean startup uh, toolkit uh, things and the main point of, the, uh, of our efforts is validating or invalidating uh, an idea, basically. The teams are way smaller. Uh, we don't use uh, like 10 people to work on these small things. Um, it's mostly like a pair, I'd say. Uh, most experiments are run in, in pairs. Um, the teams might be bigger, but they kind of you know, dissipate into smaller teams to work on uh, different experiments at the same time. Um, the goal, of course, in the experiment phase is to find product market fit as fast as possible. Um, we only use Scrum in the scaling phase and the growth phase. Uh, and this is, I think this is really important. Um, Scrum is really good if there's still like, if you, in, your, in your backlog, you can still find things that are very small, very tiny things, like, for example, changing a price on your product. And if that leads to, um, to a jump in productivity and jump in value you uh, create and value you receive back, um, you monetize from your customers, that's exactly what, what this little curve means. You still have little things you can change in, the, in your product and it leads to a jump in, um, in value that's being created. So that's the growth phase. And I think Scrum is perfect there. We, uh, all our products that are in the growth phase are being served by Scrum teams. And then there's a, a harvest phase, um, which is kind of, well, we have, we have products where no one has worked on them for a number of years because you know, they, they got optimized so well that uh, they kind of auto run themselves and um, no one is really uh, working on them or developing any further. And this is where you really make uh, the money and um, where, or, yeah, where the, all the revenue comes from at Zipgate. Um, and um, yeah, we mostly use Kanban teams there. And uh, of course the focus is on, you know, getting more customers and not so much on developing stuff. Uh, so to sum it up, we're a decentralized org. Um, multiple clan-like structures do exist coexist in at Zipgate. Um, it's not all the same and the most uh, challenging part is things change all the time. Uh, like teams move from one phase to the next, products um, grow uh, from the experiment phase to the, uh, to the growth phase. Um, yeah, new strategic um, str yeah, goals emerge. And that's kind of, uh, yeah, it's, sometimes um, hard <laughs> to kind of manage this because it's so um, yeah decentralized as it should be um, and i think and that's that's what i want to talk to, uh, about today i think especially in the covid 19 pandemic with the move to the home office for everyone it's a bit as well uh, there are two things that really helped us uh, do this uh, transition um, and uh, uh, I want to uh, share with you, which also um, contribute to how we how we manage this chaos. <coughs> Just a quick stop here.
So um, back in, I'd say, 2013, when we grew beyond 100 employees, which is, sent, uh, seems to be like a, quite a magic number where you need to organize differently again, um, we noticed that we had a story to tell. And uh, we also had to tell stories which we weren't really good at before. So um, uh, yeah, we got into that. And uh, this is what we, we've come up with. This is kind of the scaffolding that um, enables our organization to work uh, the way we, we do today. Um, this is our why, Simon Sinek, um, uh, choose freedom. And the basic, the, the foundational thing that we believe in is um, that we don't believe that bu bureaucratic systems are, uh, are yeah, things that will survive in the long term. <laughs> uh, as our society gets more complex, overly bureaucratic systems were, are simply built to fail. So this freedom, giving people freedom is what um, on, on the one hand is really important to us, uh, but it's it also uh, you can also feel it in the products like we offer like in our uh, business PBX system we offer more features and more freedom to configure it the way you need it uh, to be you want it to to be uh, than any of our competitors so um, it kind of um, plays in the same uh, direction uh, that's not all we have a number of uh, documents this is all text. Um, like I said before, for the team goals, um, mostly one piece of paper. It should fit on one paper, and it's mostly uh, written in in English. Uh, what we want to reach. There's uh, three steps of things that we um, we, ha we have. Uh, one is the why, which is like the overarching thing. Then there's the winning aspiration, um, which is the future state of the company in five years. So, um, and most important thing is this is not, we're not finished when we come up with uh, uh, this future state of the company with this one pager document we we don't stop uh, working on it but it constantly gets annotated and it constantly gets changed so uh, it's like a living document it's not we're not finished for the next four and a half years uh, before we touch this document again which is important I think because things change uh, change a lot at Zipgate and in uh, in our environment, so um, we want to keep this updated as quickly as possible. Uh, there's also the strategic intent. This is our major, it outlines mostly three uh, major efforts that we want our uh, company to move towards in the next 12 months. So this might be something like, I don't know, uh, apps on any device or um, let's say, uh, we want our AI to be a part of our products, whatever, you, you know, like overarching efforts that should reach, should touch all our products in the next 12 months. Um, it's not, it's not written in there what this exactly is, like what the product is or could be, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like a story we tell uh, the world is moving into this direction and let's find a niche in this, uh, in this new opportunity and use it for our uh, purposes, for our products. And then there's product intents, which is kind of breaking down all the stuff I told you before um, into smaller chunks that the teams can work with. And this um, doesn't necessarily come from us, um, from the op team. Um, this, these are documents that are being created by the teams themselves, the product intent. Um, and uh, we have a workshop format that always starts with us presenting uh, the winning aspiration and the strategic intent again. And uh, the team uh, kind of in, in this workshop, half day workshop format comes up with their uh, product intents, like how do, do they think they can move the product into that direction that we wanna, that we wanna take. So anyone notice that we never use KPIs? <laughs> um, we think that KPIs are in the distribution of work not really helpful. And um, this is a cool sentence I've come up with. 
Yeah, I'm going to read it. Uh, strangely, the introduction of algorithmical measurements seems to correlate with the total collapse of trust and competence in many organizations. Um, so I see a lot of um, companies uh, that visit us to see how we work. Um, like before the pandemic, we had around 13,000 visitors per year for the last three years. Uh, of mostly of companies that want to find out, you know, how, how to organize differently. And uh, I give a lot of presentations there to uh, tell people how to, to use uh, the stuff we've come up with, how, uh, or to basically encourage them to come up with their own stuff. And uh, what I see from many organizations that I, that I talk to is, um, like the more they, are, um, they rely on KPIs to distribute work, the less trust there is. And um, I think there's some correlation there. And um, that's basically the reason why we don't, um, we don't use KPIs in our uh, distribution of work and in the delegation process. Metrics are very important. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not that we don't use metrics at all. I'm going to talk about that later, um, how we use metrics and uh, how, that's, um, how that works out for us. Um, but let's focus a little bit on, on the storytelling part. So uh, I think a really important part is to, um, to think about storytelling, like talking to another human being. That's the most important part. So it won't help you writing something down and uh, putting it on a poster and uh, you know, slapping it in the hall uh, and hoping for people to read it. That won't, um, won't necessarily um, help you. Uh, this, by the way, is um, uh, a wall at our office with uh, where our resident artist uh, draws all our employees and people we um, we love and like. And there's Andrea Tomasini up there in the right. Uh, maybe you noticed. <laughs> um, so storytelling actually starts before uh, it really starts. Uh, this is an important point. So. Um, this is a postcard that we send regularly send new hires for so everyone who joins our company uh, receives uh, um, a postcard. Uh, that's not that's just one small example, but we, they also receive like a bunch of emails from us where we send them articles about how we work. So and what our goals are. So we want people to you know take the time before they even start working with us. Uh, it's okay to, um, to you know get used to all this information and you know taking these in and uh, reading stuff about how we organize how uh, how we manage things how uh, well what what goals we we have as a company as an organization mm. there's also an onboarding course where we tell a lot of stories <clears throat> this uh, is quite similar to a scrum master course um, I think it's a two-day uh, welcome uh, course where all new hires um, are funneled through um, you well everyone knows how we work like in on hands uh, environment and so you also learn how to uh, how to use stickies <laughs> um, our this is our um, I'd say the most central part the the, uh, the board in the back here um, our company the uh, central tool that we use to distribute work at Zipgate um, and it's also based on, uh, to an extent, on storytelling. Um, all these links there are teams and uh, their goals are being updated there and the whole company gathers around this board every Monday and there's a whole company stand-up, um, we call it the product uh, stand-up or portfolio stand-up, sorry, um, uh, every Monday and of course this has moved to uh, to an, an uh, online version of it. It's a Miro board um, that we use now because everyone is in the home office, but we had a physical representation of this board before and the whole, well, not the whole, but I'd say like almost half of, every, of the whole company gathered around this board at every Monday at 1, uh, 1 p.m. Um, one more thing is really important to us and we, we kind of want teams to push their results and to push their, the, the things they find out about problems uh, and possible solutions. So a lot of teams use um, whiteboards or now digital boards uh, to push information 
to the rest of the company so everyone can uh, uh, yeah can find out what people are working on can get a feeling for which problems are being tackled right now uh, or other teams are working on the same problem maybe that's something I should take a look at and um, I think that's really uh, important of course um, asynchronous information distribution is now more important than ever to us now that we've reached um, more than 200 a uh, little over 200 employees uh, all these presence uh, meetings aren't um, helping us that much anymore but um, some of the stuff is moving to uh, to uh, asynchronous and, and, uh, things like documents text and um, this is another part that's really interesting i think uh, like every two weeks every um, second friday uh, like all the backlogs in the company are left where they are and um, the whole day is being or is dedicated to everyone finding the stuff where, where they think they can be most helpful in the company and um, yeah so you decide yourself you, you all the little problems are being tackled on these open fridays and there's also an open space format to talk about things. Um, everyone gets a voice. You can just walk up there to this board and post a sticky there and uh, and say, I want to talk about whatever uh, whatever topic uh, you think is uh, important to the company. Um, yeah, of course, this is really important in storytelling. Uh, we, I, I think this is, uh, we're still not doing that well enough. You have to repeat it a lot, a lot, a lot of times. Uh, like. What are you working on? What what are really your goals and why? Uh, this is really important to keep in mind that you need to repeat and repeat and repeat um, the stuff you've come up with. Uh, it does it really doesn't help just putting it in a document and leaving it sleep or letting it sleep there uh, because people won't read. So no metrics up until this point, but we do use metrics at Zipgate. Um, so we have a dedicated team that um, whose full responsibility is to give all the teams the data they need to make decisions and um, because if you want 98 percent of all decisions to be made by your teams you have to give them the proper uh, data to, to base their decisions on and um, i think working with these data with, with data is the job of the teams you can't outsource to the another uh, entity um, so our analytics team analytics is actually called team analytics uh, responsibility is to help the teams there's a uh, live version of the data so you can access it in real time you don't have to wait for a month until uh, things um, find their way into the product report, which is on the first page on the right. It's a 150 page um, document in PDF format that's being sent out once a month with uh, all the uh, most important um, aspects of our business, costs, uh, revenue, whatever. And there's a live version on the left, which is based on Metabase. Uh, so everyone with a little technical SQL knowledge can make their own requests and find out uh, in real time if a new product, a new feature is um, performing or not. The problem with data and the problem with, uh, with metrics is there's a lot of data schmutz. And data schmutz is um, kind of this, I think, I think this is like the most common graph you'll see. It's something that starts in the lower left corner and uh, ends in the top right corner. Uh, all graphs, or I think even myself, like when I start drawing a, gra a graph, it, it, it always tends to fall back to this, uh, this view on, on data. And it's kind of like people expect it to look like, like a graph to look that way. And uh, this is not really helpful. If you just um, aggregate all the results, you won't see anything. And it's impossible to see uh, movements um, in your data. One example, this is a revenue graph. Um, this is not actually from us. Um, this is uh, from a presentation from, uh, I think, from Christoph Jans. Um, not, not, not really sure, but um, it's just, a, uh, just an example here. Uh, this is what most revenue lines look like. Starts in the lower left and ends in top right. Um, and if you view this data by cohort, like by age of customer, like in the um, yeah, in which month uh, someone signed up for your service, uh, the data 
can tell really different stories. And um, this is, looks quite similar, especially in the beginning, these two graphs here. Uh, but you notice that the one here is growing. So each cohort, the revenue is growing. Um, uh, while here you're losing revenue, it still looks the same. I mean, the, the resulting graph is just a pretty much a straight line. Um, you get to exponential growth if you find a, a negative turn um, like this one. Uh, but in the beginning, it still looks like a straight line. So um, I think it's really important to um, work with cohorts. And we encourage all our teams to work with cohorts. This is what a cohort looks like. As I told you, it's like a, a separation uh, by date, like age of customer, like which month did someone begin. And then um, you aggregate all the customers that started uh, in this month and, and you can see how they, through their life, how the revenue, how their, uh, we use other numbers like uh, click metrics and stuff as well, uh, how they, um, how they, this group performed throughout the months and even years. And if you do that and change something in the product and you have this data, you can see where exactly where your results are, like where the change that you made in the product, the new feature, where exactly it is uh, successful and where it is not. Is it the new customers? Is it the old customers? Is it uh, in the first month? Is it the second? Is it the third? Whatever, you'll find out it's beautiful to work with that kind of uh, insight. Um, so it's really important to educate about how to use data. And um, I think it's really important to define what is important. And we have this uh, little presentation here that I uh, showed to everyone in Subgate who asked about like, what should I measure? How should we uh, proceed with um, measuring things? And we have uh, quite a few definitions of uh, what data is important for us and how, like, should the tax rate be included in the data or not, for example. No, that's something every team uh, struggles with at first. Like, we don't want every team to come up with their own solutions to which data to find out. Um, these, are, um, these are things that we've come up with uh, on our own. Uh, it's not well. Some of th some of the uh, things here are uh, industry standard, but like min profit or BTP uh, are things that we we've come up with to support our goals. Um, there's also some uh, pitfalls in using data. The common things that um, a lot of teams get wrong when they first start working with data, and we have a list uh, where where we keep these things as constraints and give these constraints to, uh, to the team so they uh, don't run into these pitfalls. Um, this is an example here. Yeah, and as I uh, told you before, um, one of the things we do at Zipkit is pro uh, publish this monthly report to push it is really important. So it, um, it's kind of a semi-automated report. Uh, there's some manual labor involved in stitching it together, the 150 page thing, but most of the stuff is automated and we mail it out. And we also, our analytics team, uh, they comment um, these uh, product reports. So they, like when they post them, they send them out, uh, they, um, they publish key findings that they think have changed in the report. So people can, you know, oh, there's something new. Uh, let me take a look at the raw data in there. Um, there's also quite a lot of annotation visual, visualization at uh, Zipgate. We work with this data and tell stories based on these uh, metrics and we base a lot of decisions like where uh, um, we should invest in onboarding new users, for example, um, or not. Uh, that will be something that we try to see in the data and to measure if this if a team is success, successful in, for example, uh, um, yeah, helping a, a conversion rate or hiring a um, conversion rate here. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, if you work with cohorts, there's a lot of uh, stuff that you can um, use uh, to, to display the data that doesn't involve graphs from 
running from the lower left right to the top right side. Um, I think, uh, yeah, if, if you're interested, I can uh, maybe share uh, more examples later on. So that was it, I think, quite on time. <laughs> Uh, so far, thank you very much. I think we're going to start with a uh, Q&A session. Yes, that's completely correct. Uh, thank you very much, Bastian. Very interesting to listen to your presentation. And we have actually got uh, a lot of questions, so I think we should just uh, jump into them. Uh, I was thinking I can read you the questions, or you can then uh, give your answers so we have them on the recording. Hope that's fine with you. Let's do that. Um, let's start just with uh, one question here. It seems that storytelling is quite important at Zipgate. On the other hand, not all people are very good in telling stories. How do you help such people in developing these skills? Uh, that's completely true, and it's, it poses a huge problem. I, won't, I wouldn't say that we're perfect in storytelling. Um, I think probably around 10% of People can actually write text so that other people love reading it. Um, you know, that's not everyone can do that. It's kind of hard actually to write. You need a lot of maybe talent and practice to um, to actually do storytelling in a way that it engages the reader and you know people want to read more. Um, so this is quite hard to get uh, get right and. Um, I think we're not perfect here, but we encourage people to use it by offering these workshop uh, format uh, um, uh, events. And um, so everyone uh, like at Zipgate gets to write stories at some point and they slowly get better over time. That's kind of the main point here. Thank you. Amy, do you have a question you want to pick? Um, yeah, so this one's from Peter. What made you choose uh, Miro over the standard tool choice, such as Jira? Uh, we did, I think we still use Jira at some, at, uh, in some part of our organization. I think one Kanban team still uses it after 10 years. Um, actually, we, Jira was one of the things we tried before moving uh, to Scrum in 2009, 2010. Uh, it's one of the tools we, you know, we thought software would help us, but would bring salvation. It didn't. Uh, Jira was kind of a really big mess at Zipgate uh, when we rolled it out over uh, through the whole organization because um, these online tools seem to aggregate the things that are never going to be worked on, and that's kind of not the point, is it? <laughs> we want to focus on only the stuff that is being worked on or that's good, that people are going to work on and leave out everything else and leave out all the noise and throw it all away because the good ideas will come back most definitely um so you don't need a tool to um you know keep all to keep track of thousands of ideas which was the case our jira installation i'm not a big fan of online tools and i think jira uh, i think miro has one um uh, advantage and it, it's quite visual and in the move from in our move from uh, physical boards to uh, online um, virtual to a virtual room um, it helped us because the, it's structured exactly this, the same way we, we kind of used Miro to uh, pixel perfect draw the physical board that's kind of our way of transitioning which poses its own uh, challenges, of course, but uh, that's the reason we chose Miro to make a pixel-perfect pixel version of the physical board. Okay, cool, great, thanks. Um, then here's a question, how do you measure customer satisfaction? Do you use NPS? NPS poses some problems in uh, itself. Um, I think uh, which are uh, well documented. Um, some of our teams use NPS, but the basic idea at Zipgate is that um, customer success, like if, if I want to find out if a product is successful, I'm never gonna talk to the team. I'm never gonna talk to marketing. I'm never gonna talk to, um, to the 
people who run the ad ads, I'm going to talk to our controlling and ask them, do you think our product is successful? Because they have a much better view, um, like in the uh, in the whole, and they can they can compare it to other teams working on different problems, and um, so I think that's that's better. But in terms of customer success, like if a product is successful or shows sign of signs of su success, especially in the early. Um, uh, early phase in the, the experiment phases uh, of our uh, efforts, I think it's more important to really talk to customers and to find a small number of customers that really need your product. It's not much, not about finding large numbers and NPS score above a certain point and stuff. It's about finding a small number of customers that really, really love your product. And that's different in the larger, in the, uh, the larger products, of course, but in, this, in the first phase, that's way more important. So I really like to talk to these customers. Um, you know, I, I love talking to them and speaking to them and asking them, why do you love this so much? And what's better than anything else? And uh, yeah, I think NPS is, one way but it's not really how should i say i think it's being abused a lot <laughs> yeah thank you okay so the next one is concerning asynchronous communication how do you handle email dysfunction or overload um i don't think we have email overloads at zipgate no as, so now in the new like before for, before the pandemic everyone you know all the teams had their own room so they would meet every day and just they could just talk things through in physical presence now that everyone's uh, sitting at home in the home office um we like most of the teams still use video chat to be in the same virtual room all day so we use a discord server for that and people just mute themselves and if someone has a question if someone starts talking they pick it up and uh, and join the conversation so i think this inner team communication is still a lot um yeah synchronous and uh, not much email involved here i rarely get emails so if you want to send me one <laughs> that's my email <laughs> <laughs> Okay, cool. No, it's very interesting. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Mm, then here's another, a little bit longer question, but uh, let's take it anyway. Since the teams have close contact with the customer, how are you making sure this knowledge is not lost on a strategic level? The goal setting and intent seems mostly top down, or is there also a feed from employees into the strategic direction? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I should have mentioned that <laughs> uh, because it's really important in our uh, uh, strategic scaffolding in the company. There's, of course, there's a really important way back. And that's actually the reason why our documents change so much, why our, uh, even the five year future state of the company vision changes on a regular basis. It doesn't change every day, but like I'd say once a month, maybe every two months. Uh, there's a, a change in that. Um, that's because we are part of these workshops that the teams do, and we um, receive feedback uh, from the teams how they interpret what we've come up with. And sometimes there's things that are easily misunderstood, and we we need to change the wording in a special in a certain sentence, um, for example. Or we sometimes we throw out. Uh, a whole paragraph and replace it with something else because because of things teams find out in the trenches <laughs> working with the customers um, so that's that's the reason why this these documents all change a lot thank you uh, then here's a question if you imagine that COVID disappears tomorrow and you can go back to work in the way you like would you still use Miro uh, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, I, I, I'm, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I think being in the same room has certain advantages. And I think we got this far as Zipgate 
with only 200 people um, because uh, to a part because we were co-located all the time um, but on the other hand I, in moving to the home office I don't see any negative impact yet <laughs> so actually we've seen teams with boosts in productivity um, I, I'd say like right now I think it's not really a question of being in the same room but maybe the the other stuff is really really works out well for us like all the scaffolding all the storytelling all the metrics maybe it's the other stuff that really supports our organizations and our goals uh, and maybe it's not as much the physical presence that I thought it was before <laughs> thanks um so how long do people work in this with the same people or in the same teams uh, and how can you achieve uh, cohesion and collaboration okay so i think when you first start with agile anything agile really <laughs> uh, it makes sense to stay in the in the, to keep your teams as yeah as protected as possible i'd say um and not change people around all the time but i think we are quite fluid now um and people move all the time i think that's because we've done it for such a long time and it doesn't you know the, the cost associated with uh moving a team or moving someone from one team to another uh, which was huge in the beginning because the team had to, you know, recalibrate and find out how they want to work all over again. Um, this has gone down so much that we don't really notice it anymore. And it's so, uh, so little impact. Sometimes with new hires, it poses a problem to them that things ch change so much. But we, we try to uh, support people that join our organization and, and at least for the first half year, keep them in pretty steady waters. Thanks. Um, then here's a question. What was the biggest challenge your company faced since COVID-19? How was working from home affected? Uh, how has working from home affected your team's productivity? Do you measure that or have some kind of metrics? Um, we don't have productivity metrics because well, I think it's really hard to measure. <laughs> it's um, kind of uh, impossible. So uh, what I look for when, like, or in, in the beginning, like in March and April, what we looked for was, uh, um, yeah, small signs for productivity changes, like only hints. Um, it wasn't really okay we measured everyone at the company i think that really the algorithmic measurement of everything is kind of a major drag in most organizations uh, so we we didn't do that ever um but i see like for example that there's certain teams where like for example our support teams where you can where we were able to see huge upticks in uh telephone calls and tickets being solved huge and um yeah, I, th I think that's that. For example, that's one of the um, indicators I I have for that. Yeah. Were there any other challenges during COVID that you recognized? Um, well, one of the challenges that we're still working on is th this move to asynchronous um, collaboration. Uh, I think we're and this. Maybe that it's not really a problem because of COVID-19 itself, not because of home office in itself, but maybe because we are more than people now and um, it doesn't scale that much to have synchronous meetings. Like if the whole company needs to join for an hour, that's you know a huge cost attributed to that. To me, it doesn't seem like that's sensible or yeah, it doesn't really make sense to have that for all uh, organizational issues or organizational challenges to, to make huge presence meetings and video video conference meetings. Um, so we're 
slowly finding out things that can move to text and uh, move to other formats. We, I, I kind of really like uh, this Google Docs annotation stuff that I showed you before, because it, uh, it helps you get clear wording about what your goals are and what the decision is and the whole context uh, in one document and everyone who feels responsible for uh, being part of this decision can just join and comment and, uh, and change the wording. Uh, so that for me, that works really well. And I think that's a good example of, of how things can work, except for, uh, for uh, if, if you want to move away from this uh, synchronous uh, meeting stuff. Thank you. We have, by the way, a request from the audience to see us. So could you please, Bastian, stop uh, your screen sharing before we take the last question? Because unfortunately, time is running out. So Amy, you can you can pick the last question for today. OK, great. OK, so the last one's from Giuseppe. What do you say to people visiting your company who seem to be looking for the silver bullet solution or want to implement the SIPgate model? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's, <laughs> I think pretty much everyone that visits us uh, comes in the door with that, uh, with the hope of finding something, this one silver bullet solution. And um, I'm not able to offer that. I think, uh, I think what people realize when they walk, when they take the tour through our office and see all the stuff we've come up with and, um, um, is that it's actually a lot of work to to structure an organization in a way that it's not in a pyramid style. I think that's the pyramid style is really the easy thing to do. It's I think maybe that's because or that's why many organizations default to that style of organizing and uh, to you know having managers and someone who decides and clearly. Uh, carved out responsibilities and stuff. Um, I think people are, when, when they walk out in, uh, walk into our doors, they're surprised by the chaos. It looks, it looks chaotic a bit. And um, so at first there's like this shock moment. <laughs> what? <laughs> All the walls are, you can't see any walls. There's post-its everywhere and stuff. Um, but uh, once you they, they walk through, they, they see that it's a lot of, well, actually the, the most important thing is giving people the, the, the freedom and you know, giving them the resp responsibility to make these decisions themselves. And, and I think that's new to, to many people. And to me, like in the, as a general concept, that is kind of the uh, silver bullet to, we want as, little questions, as little issues as possible to reach uh, our CEOs. And that's totally, un, you know, that's mind boggling to uh, most people that visit us. Yeah. Cool, great, thank you. Thank you and thank you uh, everyone for all your good questions. Unfortunately, there are some questions that are unanswered, but Bastian basically asked for emails. So if you want to ask him something, you can still maybe send him an email afterwards and he will probably be happy to answer any of your unanswered questions. You can also reach out to us at Agile42 if there is something we can support you with. Mm, Bastian, thank you really, really much for being here today. Uh, it was a nice, nice presentation from you. Uh, we really enjoyed it. Thanks, Amy, for the help also behind the scenes. Um, hopefully, we will see you guys in the afternoon when we have the Menlo tour with Rich Sheridan. That would be awesome if you can join also there. And tomorrow, there's the last webinar. So keep your eyes up for this. Big thanks to you guys that donated also today. Really, really cool. Hope we have some more donations still so we can help help the rest. Um, thanks for today and uh, see you in the afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>